Bible, raise your hand, because we're going to be going through the Word, as we always do here, and we're going to be covering the first 16 verses this morning of Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, and um, we're going to continue through seeing Paul's uh, finishing up his third missionary journey and heading back to Jerusalem. We will get there sooner or later into Jerusalem, uh, as in verse 16, but um, he's making his trek, leaving Ephesus. I've titled this morning's message, Footprints on Our Hearts, and the reason why is because so many times people come into our lives, and they come into our lives for a short season. Paul the Apostle had been going through all of Asia and uh, also through, the, through Europe and now even going back to Macedonia. And he's going to these places and he's been planting churches and he's been talking with people and there's been new converts there, Gentiles getting converted to Jesus Christ from, from Judaism or from just um, uh, those who were following false idols. We know he was involved and in, he's going to be going back to Greece this morning and we're going to follow him there. And, uh, you know, a lot of those Greeks, they were very, they had many, many gods, right? You remember his time uh, up in, in Greece to where there was even a, a, a statue to the unknown God. So they had many, many gods that they were following. And, uh, but except for the one true God, the one true God, Jehovah God. And so Paul had gone there as well. And so many, many Gentiles also became converted in the sense from these idol worshiping to really worshiping the one true living God. And so remember also that, you know, there was only really two groups of people as there really are even today. You know, there's, there's Jews and there's Gentiles. If you're not a Jew, guess what? You're a Gentile. No matter what uh, race, religion, whatever, I mean, you are a, or ethnicity, ethnicity, you are a Gentile if you're not Jewish, if you're not born of, of that. So um, even today, we still see the same thing. And so back then, it was no different. And so those Gentiles were coming to the Lord, and what a great, great blessing it was as the church is growing and the church is coming to life. And, and, and the gospel of Jesus Christ is, is going throughout the world through Paul, the apostle, and his other disciples as well. We're going to see some of these disciples this morning that are with him. And what a blessing it is to have guys with Paul. We see that whole, that whole thing of leadership and that whole thing of guys who catch a vision and guys who run with that one guy who is moving forward in the things of the Lord. So important, so important. So this morning, you know, last week we left and uh, left off in chapter 19, and we're now picking up in chapter 20. And last week we left off with a real frenzied kind of riot that was going on, a real mob that was happening in Ephesus at the, uh, at the theater near the Temple of Diana. And this guy, a silversmith by the name of Demetrius, he and his cohorts, um, they gathered together, and these guys, remember, they were making all these little idols out of, uh, uh, of Diana, and it was hitting into their pocketbook, in other words. It was hitting into the bottom line, and they didn't like it. And so it was really a, a, a money-generated thing. It had nothing to do with, with even Diana, that, that false goddess. But you know what? Demetrius and his friends, they want to, at this point, really tear apart Paul the Apostle and his disciples because these guys are hitting them where it hurts and, and they want their pound of flesh from Paul. But God, you know, God sent a, a man, a very unlikely man, which is of Ephesus, and he happened to be the, 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 the town clerk, the, the administrator, if you will, of Ephesus, that, that large city. And he went in, as we read, and he made sense, and he reasoned with the people. And, and you know, I, I'm going to stop here for a second because I said, but God. The reason why is because many times we can be going through situations and trials and, and circumstances, but God. You know, God is the one who has sent a very unlikely person, this town clerk. And we just don't know what God's going to do, do we? But God. But God's going to going to come to the rescue, but God's going to give us encouragement, but God's going to strengthen us, but God is going to encourage us because God loves us. And so he uses the simple town clerk to bring reason unto the people. Up to 25,000 people were there in this theater, a, a big mob. 
Yet he calms their hearts, he calms their spirits, and they disperse. So now Paul picks his bags uh, and, and he charts now a course to Macedonia. So I think it'd be fun this morning as we join him as his next adventure uh, heading towards Macedonia. I want to show you a slide of Macedonia and this area. And there's one there on the screen. Uh, you're going to see the numbers up there on the screen. And right now we are in Ephesus, which is around number two. And it's going to be going to three, four, then down to five, six, and seven, then to eight to Miletus. We're going to read about that as well. And then he's making his trek all the way down to Israel, down to Jerusalem. And so Paul is going to be covering, he has covered a lot of ground, has he not? He's covered a ton of miles. And he finds himself now way over there in Greece. And now he's going to be making his way back to Jerusalem. You know, some people, I've got a quote for you, some people come into our lives and quickly go. Some stay for a while, yet leave footprints on our hearts, and we are never, ever the same. And that seems, I think, to be a very good description of our brother Paul the Apostle. He had gone into these different places. There have been converts, there have been people that he's loved on, people that have loved on him. And he's gone there and he's, he's made an impression upon their hearts. And I think that's the most important thing. Is that whenever we leave some place, some situation, some, some whatever it might be, especially in church or especially in times of ministry, when we go into the missions field a lot, we, we find that the, the big, biggest blessing I find is leaving an impression upon the hearts of the people that were there. And you find that you leave that impression because in today's society, we have the opportunity to email and to Facebook and to, to FaceTime and to do all of these different things. And what's really cool about it is that you can maintain communication. I got a, a, a Thanksgiving, uh, a, I guess, a tweet, if you will, from uh, one of the guys, young guys I met when I was in Italy. And uh, what a blessing it was just to, and he's way up in, in the place in Feltre, which is way up in the northern part of Italy by the, by the, by the mountain range. And, and so he's there and he thinks about me for whatever reason and he puts me on his heart and he just wants to say happy Thanksgiving that he's praying and he's thinking about me. And so you see it's out that lasting impression that you leave upon people. That's so very important. That's what Paul does. And that's why I've titled this morning's message, Footprints on Our Heart. In verses 1 through 6, turn your attention now to verse 1 of chapter 20 of the book of Acts. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the, apostles, the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had, done, when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece stayed there three months, and when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia. Also Aristarchus and Secundus of, Thessalon of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. Verse 6, but when we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and in five days joined them at Troas where we stayed seven days. So the next battle is going to be ensuing. The next battle is coming up now for Paul and his disciples. But in verse 1, let's take a look at that. It says, and after the uproar had ceased... What's nice about uproars is that they do cease in a matter of time. What's nice about a trial, it does have a beginning and it has an end. Or a time of tribulation, or a situation, or circumstance. It has its beginning and it has its end. We just don't know how long it's going to last, do we? But it does have a fixed beginning and end. And uproars, I'm encouraged, that come into my life will usually cease. So my encouragement to you this morning is to be patient and to wait on the Lord. And don't be like last week's message, freaking out, but peace out. 
Peace out with Jesus. He's still sovereign. He hasn't forgotten you. He's still on the throne. He still loves you. Be patient. Why do we want to be patient? Because we want to be ready for the next battle. The life of a Christian can be filled with battles. I would almost be bold to say, if your life is very perfect, I'd even ask you, then what are you actually doing for the kingdom of God to ruffle the feathers of Satan, the devil, that enemy of Jesus, that enemy of the kingdom? What is it you're doing or not doing that is ruffling or not ruffling the feathers of the enemy? I think there's a question that comes about on this, though, and it's how do we, in fact, ready ourselves for battle? Well, the first thing is we need to be praying for others and we need to be praying for strength through the situation. We're encouraged by Ephesians 6 in verse 18. We're encouraged to be praying always and with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Isn't that great? See, we're to be praying, praying before the trial, praying through the trial, and praying following the trial. Because that battle is going to come. It's going to happen in our lives sooner or later. And we need to be praying, praying for others, and praying for strength for ourselves. And the scripture in Ephesians tells us how often are we to be praying. Well, it does say plainly, always. What are we to be praying? With all prayer and supplication. Supplication would be something that is specific. Something specific you're praying for in the spirit, which is opposite of of the flesh. That means in your own natural, of yourself. It says being watchful. Remember I said there's battles? Being watchful. See, prayer gives us the opportunity by the Spirit of God, that He gives us this this understanding about what's coming before. He prepares our hearts and He prepares our minds for that ensuing battle up ahead. So we're encouraged that with prayer comes the ability to be watching. And we're to be watching with all perseverance, praying with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So prayer isn't just for you. But prayer is for all the saints. We're not to be coming to the Lord just asking Him to do for us. But we're supposed to be interceding on behalf of others as well. That's the purpose of prayer. Praying, of course, for our needs or the things going on in our lives. But also praying for other people. What's going on in their lives. Things you may know, things you may not know about. But just lifting them up before God. Have you ever had an opportunity where God just puts someone on your heart? You don't know why that's happened? But you just, God says, pray for this person right here and right now. Oh Lord, but I'm driving. That's okay. Keep your eyes open and lift that person up to the Lord. Oh Lord, but I'm at work. That's okay. At your next break or right then and there, say a short prayer. Lift that person up before God. And so God gives us this instruction on how we're to handle ourselves and be ready before that next battle comes. Also in verse 1 it says, Paul called the disciples to himself. And he did some neat things here. He embraced them for once. And then he departed. Matthew Henry, a commentator, says this, Loving friends know not how well they love one another till they come to part, and then it appears how near they lay to one another's hearts. Pretty much, this guy's from way back when, so what he's really saying is that we really don't understand how much love we have for one, excuse me, for one another until we depart from one another. And that's so true whether you've been on a missions trip or whether you're having a gathering at your house, 
time for everyone to come together and just hang out and then they leave. There's just that departing that's sweet, but yet there's such a love, such a love there. In verse 2, it tells us that now when he had gone over that region, he encouraged them with many words. So, so what is the them? Who are the them? Well, specifically in context, we're looking at the churches of Philippi and the churches of Thessalonica, those of whom were already planted. That word encouraged is a cool word. It doesn't mean just, you know, let's just go one for the gipper or, or let's, let's uh, you know, have some positive thoughts about things or pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. But when we encourage someone, we're called to, as the definition shows us, to comfort one another. And I think encouragement, the purpose, which is different from exhortation, is to comfort one another. Also, that involves praying. And we're to be praying in comfort for one another. It goes hand in hand. Romans 15.4 says this, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. That, you can say so that, or because, we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. What encouragement is that? You see, I don't know about you guys, I pray you do, but I get encouragement from the Word of God. I get encouragement from reading the Scriptures. It's not just a book. It's not just letters on a page. But it's true encouragement and water for my soul. And it really blesses me and comforts me. And these things in this Bible, this book, are things that are meant for that purpose. That we learn, that we grow, that we be encouraged, that we be exhorted, sometimes that we be challenged, sometimes we be rebuked by the Word, sometimes we're convicted by the Word of God. These types of things the Word gives me. Well, after Greece, he winters now in Corinth, and it's where we believe that he penned the book of Romans, because it's between AD 56 and 57. And he's preparing a way now. As he's writing the book of Romans, he's preparing the way now for what he said in the last chapter. That he has great hope to go to Rome. That was the first mention of of us understanding this this impassion that he has in his heart. That is such a, a passionate thing. And he's preparing the way now for what he hoped would be a real pastoral visit to the capital city of the Roman Empire. Just like the other times that he had gone. So he's visiting the Greek churches that were planted and he's watering them now. It's kind of cool. That's why we at this church also do the same thing. We'll go back to the churches that we visited before in the different countries because maybe we've planted something, but now we're watering. That's what Paul the Apostle is doing. He's watering. In verses 3 and 4, it tells us he stays there three months. And then we find out the Jews are plotting against him yet again as he was about to set sail to Syria and leave that place. But there's a group of guys here that really encourage me. Because these were guys, of course, that before didn't know Jesus Christ. And now these guys are disciples of Jesus Christ. And they've caught the vision from Paul the Apostle. They've caught that vision. Pastor Chuck Smith would say that a vision is not taught, but a vision is caught. And that is very true. I throw vision out all the time or I throw something out all the time and I just want to see where it lands and who catches it. It's so important that those who catch the vision then follow right along and we do ministry together. So Paul and his friends, they they find and they uncover some kind of a plot, we could call it, on his life to kill him. 
probably he'd get on this boat to Syria and then they'd kill him at sea or something like that. So he changes his plans. But in verse 4, we see Paul's got a little school of leadership going, a little discipleship school going. He's got all of these different men, and you can read them throughout the book of Acts about them and what they go on to do, especially Timothy or, or, or even Tychicus or Trophimus, these different guys. And you know what? Um, it's something, like I said earlier, about having a group of guys that are just following Jesus. A group of guys that are all on fire for Christ. That come what may, they are there with whoever might be encouraging them or leading them on to do amazing things. But it's up to those men, like these men, to catch the vision that is being thrown. And if they don't catch the vision, they won't be a part of the blessing. That's just what it is. And so we see here that, that Paul and his friends, they're, they're doing ministry together and they're going together. He really didn't need them, I don't believe, to be with him. Paul is like that guy who's that special ops guy who goes out and he gets, goes to this place. He plants churches. He may have one guy with him. But all of these guys, they're, 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 they could have been maybe, I'm, I'm thinking, well, in these different places ministering. But no, Paul wanted them together and together with him so that he continues to train them up. And he continues to show them what we're going to read here, which is the manner or the pattern of his life. And it's so important that as guys are together, whether it's the pastor of a church or the leader of a ministry or somebody in that sense leading and those around him that are following with him, that they see the manner or the pattern of, their, of the life of that individual. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So it's very, very important, I believe. I know that in my own life, that's what we did back in our church in California, is that I was always around my pastor, and I was always around just watching him do things. Some things I'd scratch my head, and i go, whoa, I wouldn't have done it that way. And some things I'm like, wow, I never thought that that would ever work out, but it did. And so just by being around one another, by being around, I was able to learn then ministry firsthand. I had a thirst for the ministry. I had a desire to be involved in the ministry, but I didn't know what to do. The only thing I knew what to do was hang around the guy who had been doing it. And the Lord taught me a lot. And so my encouragement for you men here this morning, and or even ladies, gather around those leaders. See what they do. See how they do things. Emulate. Look at the pattern of their lives. So that you too, if you want to continue doing these amazing things for the Lord, you can at least see something. You can see an example so many people say, I don't need that, and they go off and do their own thing. And then they ultimately fail because they did not and they were not around anyone where they could glean from. So it's very, very important, I believe. So Paul has this leadership school here going on. And they would be trained up by Paul so that they might know his doctrine and manner of life as he exhorted Timothy in 2 Timothy 3. Well, he journeys on then to the land of Macedonia and he sails there from Jerusalem, for Jerusalem, verses 5 and 6. He says, these men going ahead waited for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And in five days we joined them at Troas where we stayed seven days. Interesting, two words here that you probably see that are different is the word we, actually uh, three words, us, and two words, we. What does that mean? Well, remember last time we noticed when Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, was with Paul, he's departed, but now Luke is back on the scene. He's with them, actually. And remember, an eyewitness is the one writing these things down, not just secondhand information. 
but a true eyewitness of the happenings with Paul and the other disciples. And so he's joined by Luke, and they remain in Philippi until after the days of unleavened bread. Well, what are the days of unleavened bread? Well, up on the screen, I've got here a general description of it. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins the next night after the Passover and celebrates Israel being delivered from bondage in Egypt. Okay, so what's the Passover? If you remember the exodus from Egypt, it was that evening, that night, that they were to sprinkle blood over the doorposts, that they were to bake unleavened bread, that they were to... to, to to have the sacrifice or eat, and then they were to wait because that angel, that, that angel of death, so to speak, was going to be flying over and the firstborns would be, would die. But the blood represented the slain lamb. Just as Jesus represents the slain, slain lamb for you and me. You see, the covering of the doorposts of that blood the angel of that death passed over, and, it's, and it's, it symbolizes for us what Jesus did for you and for me. It symbolizes fully the fact of the blood of Jesus Christ, we cannot die. Yes, in the physical sense, we can die. This tent will wear out. My heart will cease beating. My lungs will cease breathing, moving. But I will not die because I have Jesus Christ. And because of Jesus Christ, I live eternally. If you have Jesus Christ in your life this morning, you live eternally. And so because we look at this, this whole Passover, we can look at it in our situation in the sense that, yes, death may pass over, but we don't die because of the blood of the Lamb. In fact, in Leviticus 23, this is where it comes from. These are the feasts of the Lord. If you want to make a margin or mark in your Bible, you can go back and read more of Leviticus. These are the feasts of the Lord. Holy convocations, meaning gatherings, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. We just talked about that. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Why unleavened bread? Well, leaven is a sign or a symbol of sin. Anything that has leaven in it, the little bit of leaven spoils the whole lump. A little bit of sin will spoil the life, the whole life of someone or some family. So it doesn't rise, it doesn't have leaven in it. And it says, on the first day you shall have a holy convocation, verse 7, you shall do no customary work on it. It's a day of not only a convocation, gathering, but it's also a day of sanctification, meaning setting ourselves apart. And that's the whole idea, guys, of of. of, of the being sanctified, set apart, and why they're doing this here so that they can dwell upon God. That's why they're doing it. They can dwell upon the Lord, nothing to distract them from worshiping God. And so it says, but you shall, so you don't work, but this is what we do. We don't sit back and watch ESPN, but what we do do is we shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day then shall be a holy gathering, convocation, and you shall do no customary work again, remembering God, thinking about the things of the Lord. Now it's interesting that this is mentioned here. Because if we know our Bible and we know about uh, Corinthians, it's mentioned here, I believe, mainly for a, a, a timing of things for his trip. Because I don't believe that Paul, this is my own interpretation, my own opinion. You may believe differently, and that's totally great. It's not an issue of salvation. It's just a point of reference and a point of view that I have. But I don't believe that Paul would have practiced the Passover at this time. Because he's just about, in the sense, to write 1 Corinthians. And he teaches in 1 Corinthians that Jesus is our Passover. Jesus is our Passover. 
of our lives, you see. And he is our feast of unleavened bread in a sense. It's Jesus. Paul further writes in Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17, So let no one judge you in food or drink regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, in which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ, is of Jesus. So when the substance came, which is Jesus Christ, the shadow or the image of it disappears. So there was no longer a need, in a sense, for Paul, that's why I come to this thought, is why Paul would not be then, in a sense, celebrating the Passover in the way maybe he did previously or at all. Because he is writing about Jesus Christ is our Passover. It is Jesus. So it's really important that we we understand. And it's good to look, I believe, at the feast. Read Leviticus. It's a, it's a great Old Testament book all about the, the things for the priests. And then Deuteronomy is a reiteration of that, but for the people. And really explains to us and shows us those, those Old Testament feasts and such of which the Jews still celebrate to today. You can go online or you can go there during the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths or the time of Passover and such. Well, let's continue on in in verses 7 through 12. It says this, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart for the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So, verse 7. This is a section that I call Sleepy Saints because I think we all, to a degree, can be sleepy saints. Now, I'm not talking about in our spiritual walk. I'm just talking about when we come to church. Let me share with you a funny story, although at the time it wasn't funny for me because I was the, 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 the brunt of that, of that funny situation. Some of you may have heard it. Some of you may have not. Well, I, I was in church. This was back in California. I was in church, and I, we were up the late night before doing some ministry or doing something like that, really late. Start off with first service on Sunday morning, and you know what? Everything's going great. And our pastor Tommy, he was going through the word, and I was in the back, much like more it is this morning. I was in the back, and and I don't know. I was hanging with the ushers, or I was lead usher, something like that, right? And so I'm sitting back there. So then Tommy is getting towards the end of his message, and I'm like, oh, okay, he's coming to the end of his message, and I was really, really tired, barely keeping my eyes open. So he begins to enter into prayer, right? And I put, I put my head down like this. And so I'm just down there. Well, what happens when you do this and you're already sleeping? You start like sleeping. So you're in that half, half state of sleeping, but you're, you want to be awake. You kind of know what it's like, right? And so I'm there, and then all of a sudden, all I hear is Tom pray. I'm like, my eyes opened up. And I listened again to make sure I heard it was right. Tom, pray. Well, I had zoned out so much that he was talking about the Lord speaking to him about something that the Lord called him to pray about. And so I opened my eyes and I'm like, Oh Lord, would you just pour blessings on that? And I start praying really loud from the back of the sanctuary. And I'm sure everyone's like, What's up with Tom? So Pastor Tommy, in his grace, just kind of went, okay, and he just kind of went along with it. And then after I prayed, he goes, amen, brother. (laughs) Then afterwards, he comes right up to me, he goes, hey, dummy, were you asleep? And I'm like, yes, I was asleep. How did you know? He goes, and he started laughing. And we also, it's a big joke amongst us guys over there. And you know what? Things happen, right? We're not immune to these things. So this is for all of us sleepy saints that come to church on Sunday mornings or especially on Wednesday nights. But this is a great time, folks. It really is. Because this is one of the earliest recordings of the Christian gatherings. 
They're gathering and they're meeting uh, 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 for, on the first day, it says. Get that? It says, verse 7, now on the first day of the week. Interesting. They're worshiping on the first day of the week. Worshiping Jesus. Well, what's the first day of the week? Well, the first day of the week is meant to, it honors Jesus and it honors the Holy Spirit and remembers the resurrection, of course, and also the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, going to a very secular, meaning a non-biblical reference, I thought, well, let me take the, the antithesis, the, the opposite end of, 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 of something to read, of even what the world believes the first day is. Wikipedia, of all places, says Sunday comes first in order in calendars shown in the table below. I didn't put that on. In the Judeo-Christian or Abrahamic tradition, the first day of the week is Sunday, biblical Sabbath, corresponding to Saturday, which God rested from six-day creation, made the following Sabbath the first day of the week, corresponding to Sunday. That's even according to just Wikipedia, if you Google that. So these folks are actually meeting on a Sunday, the first day of the week, to worship Jesus Christ. But there's some things that they do at this time of worship. What is it they do? Well, it says that the disciples came together to break bread. This is what I call blessings of church life. The first thing they did was the disciples came together. They had fellowship. They got together with one another. And that's really the intent, even back in the first century church, was that they would gather because they could not gather anywhere else. But they would have opportunity to gather in one of their homes in secrecy sometimes. And they would be there in sweet fellowship with one another. And so we see that they came together, and there's a purpose they came together to break bread. You see, whenever the disciples, whenever those who, who were believers of Christ come together, there's always a focus. Now, contrary to Calvary Chapel, the focus is not food, okay? But it is actually Jesus Christ. It is Jesus. Jesus should always be the main thing, the main reason of why we gather. It's Jesus-centered. And no doubt, as we read later, they partake of communion together to break bread. Acts 2.47 says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine through prayer, through fellowship, through the breaking of bread and communion. So communion is one of the key factors of our lives as Christians to celebrate. As we're going to do this morning, we're going to be celebrating commemorating, remembering Jesus Christ and what He's done for each of us on the cross at Calvary. And so they got together with a focus. Not just, you know, there's great times. Times to just hang out, you know? Times to just have a great time in the Lord. Remember, the Lord is still always the focus, even though we're just hanging out, having some coffee. And so here they, they, they're Jesus-centered. And then... Um, we see that Paul's raised to depart the next day. He spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Oh, you guys are so lucky. I love to take this Bible literally, and maybe I should teach till midnight. Hang in there today. But really, what's happening is he's preaching to them. That's the word spoke. The word spoke means preaching. So there is fellowship. The disciples come together. There is Jesus-centeredness, which is they broke bread, entered in communion. And then there is the word, because he spoke to them and continued in his message until midnight. The word of God is always to be central for us as well. How can we have Jesus and not the word, you see? How can we have the word and not Jesus? Jesus is spoken to us as the word. It's another name for him. And so they gather together for this purpose. And since he's leaving in the morning now by ship, Paul spends all the time he can with these dear saints in Troas. He wants to just hang with them as long as possible. That's how it always is when we have missionaries here, we have, or we go across the water the, for missionaries or wherever we, you just want to hang out. And it's like in our house, we, we kid around a lot because it's like there's at least five goodbyes, right? 
There's a, the goodbye when you're leaving from the kitchen, the next, then you end up talking some more, and then there's the goodbye from the living room, and then there's their, they're putting their shoes on or they're putting their coats on or whatever, getting their purses, the ladies are, and then there's more conversation and another goodbye, and then you talk about something else, and it's like, wow, an hour and a half later, you're still saying goodbye. It happens, and it's so fun. It really is. But he's talking to them now, far into the night. You know, these are going to be Paul, Paul's final words to these folks in Troas. In these times, we have to understand we may never see them again. We may never communicate with them again. Think about if we had no mail, no email, no internet, no way of communicating. What would be your last words? I mean, how wouldn't you not want to spend time with them as long as you could? And Paul does this. These are his final words. It tells us he spoke, he preached. It's interesting. These were believers already. And even though believers, Paul still knows that giving them the word is the most important thing. The most important thing for them because it would help them. It would increase in their knowledge and in their faith. And the reason why is Paul is ready to depart the next day. And that's my question to you this morning. Is that if you had only one night to spend with your family or your friends or your loved ones, what would you tell them? What would you say? What would be the most important thing on your heart that you'd want to leave them with? Maybe leaving that footprint on their heart, you know? leaving that impression upon their mind and their hearts. Paul here decides, there's absolutely nothing of me that I could ever give that's lasting. Nothing. The only thing that I can leave that is lasting is the Word of God. And it's to train them up. It's to edify them. It's to build them up. It's to help them in walking by faith. It's to help them in all of these areas because he knows he knows, he knows, he knows. He most likely will never see these folks again. So rhetorically, what would be the last thing that you would say if you only had six hours left before you had to leave somewhere and never see them again? Verse 8, it says that there were many lamps in the upper room and that they were gathered together they had no temple. They had no synagogue. They had no stately church building. Nothing to speak of but a private house. See, the place that we meet, not we specifically, but we in general, the place we meet to go over, it doesn't matter. I so believe that. I, I have met with people and I have had church in a 10-foot by 10-foot hut close to places that you wouldn't even want to go, but there's church going on. It doesn't matter. We're so spoiled here in the United States, are we not? We have everything. All the amenities from climate-controlled buildings to the, 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 the bounty of rooms to have our children's ministry in. But I challenge you to go to a place to where they don't have all of that. See where our hearts really are. Are our hearts wrapped up in what things look like or the comfort of things? Or are our hearts wrapped, wrapped around Jesus Christ? See, that's the important thing, folks. Doesn't matter doesn't matter to the first generation, to this first century church. It should not matter to us. That's why we like home Bible studies. That's why we like to, to, to meet people in different places, in different scenarios, in different uh, locations. It does not matter. Notice they gathered together, it says. They were gathered together in verse 8. No doubt again, they're, they're, they're getting ready as we... As we read later on, they're, they're going to be celebrating communion. But now kind of a funny thing happens in verse 9. Funny for us, but not for this guy Eutychus, right? It tells us 
And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep, a.k.a. Tom Hallman, right? But I'm not at the, any window. I'm in the back in a comfortable chair. He was overcome by sleep as Paul continued speaking. He fell down from the third story and was taken up dead, meaning he hit the ground, splat, you know. That's a long ways up for anybody. And if you're asleep, you're not going to be able to be, you know, all Spider-Man and, and fall properly, right? If you even can. But this guy falls out of the window. And I think every pastor is so encouraged, I thought to myself, that, man, even the great Paul the Apostle can put someone to sleep. I thought, thank you, Lord. I'm so encouraged. I'm so encouraged. For any of you guys who teach here in the room, any of you guys who teach the Word, you know, be encouraged. Even Paul didn't escape that. But there's a lot of reasons we can fall asleep, right? I think a lot of reasons. One is the church, the climate of the church. It can get stuffy. It can maybe be poorly ventilated or get too warm, as, as was in the case of Eutychus here. Because the flickering candle lights. You ever looked at a candle lamp, candle uh, flickering? You get mesmerized, right? You're there all of a sudden like, oh, you're looking and you're looking. All of a sudden, you just zone out. That little flickering light just keeps going. And hey, guess what? There's, there's no ventilation going on, no fans in the room. We've been in places to where they didn't have fans and it was so hot and you're just there sweating and, and someone's talking and you're just like, oh Lord, I don't think I'm going to make it. Drinking more water. Temperature in the room goes up. All of these shadows going on from the lights because all they had was candle light or some kind of flickering light bouncing off the room. He, Eutychus, had to go to the window. He says, I'm not hanging right now. I am going to go to the window. Some of the, some of the folks in our church, you know, they, especially on Wednesday nights, you haven't joined us on a Wednesday night, I encourage you to do so. But on a Wednesday night, they uh, will get a little tired because they're coming off work. I say, you know what? Let's go ahead, sit in the back. If things are getting a little bit too long for you, stand up, walk in the back. It's okay. It's no problem. Just kind of hang back there, stretch yourself out. Well, that's kind of what's going on here. He needed just to kind of get some air, fresh air from the window. Well, to fight off the drowsiness. Another reason is maybe if we don't get enough sleep the night before. Maybe we do end up staying up too late or whatnot and it affects us on Sunday morning. Or maybe, just maybe, it's just a lack of an interest in spiritual things. Oh, things just, you know, the Bible just doesn't excite me. Uh, the Word doesn't excite me. The, you know, things about God just don't excite me. They just don't float my boat. Maybe it's just lack of interest in spiritual things. Or maybe, like this morning, it's a boring preacher, right? I am kidding. I've got you guys so excited this morning. No one's asleep. That's how I can tell. But maybe a boring preacher. Maybe he's poorly organized or something going on or there's a monotone in his voice or it's too much time spent on something or maybe just being out of touch. In either case, I think every one of us has that propensity, if you will, to just nod right off. But let's look at Paul's heart for teaching. In Ecclesiastes 12, 9 through 11, it tells us this, and moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of the scholars like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. So if we, we look at this and we parse this particular um, uh, scripture, it tells us, as Solomon writes this, he's the writer of Ecclesiastes, he writes this and he says, he pondered and sought out, which means he studied many subjects. It's up there on the screen for you. Some of the conclusions he comes to, he writes down in the form of Proverbs. The second thing is he sets in order and he arranges things. So after he does his studies, guess what? He, he looks at his, his, his conclusions carefully and he puts them in an orderly fashion. He uses acceptable words, meaning delightful in the language, the Hebrew language. Delightful, gracious, or pleasing words. And see, you can use 
gracious words. You can use delightful words, if you will, without diluting the message, I believe. Some, some, some folks try to really hit points home with some really um, uh, stunning language, but it can be done very simply, very gracefully, very delightfully without diluting the message that's being given. Just like Jesus is able to combine grace and truth, he's able to do that as well. We, we, we do the same thing as we teach the word. He says like goads. A goad is something that you, you poke in sense. It's like if you ever see pigs go through a, 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 a I don't know what you'd call them, a, a place and, or cows getting ready to be washed or whatnot. If they don't move, you kind of poke them with this goad. And so, like goads, too, the, the, gods, the goads prod the people to pay attention and to pursue the truth. Again, the word of the wise is like goads. Next, he says, like nails. The word of the wise is like nails. Nail gives us something to, to hang something on, what we've learned. Good teaching, though, however, requires two things. One, students, folks who are motivated to study and learn. And secondly, teachers teachers that, that nail down lessons and that make sense. Verse 10, we just see how Paul rolls. This poor guy, Paul went down, fell on him and embraced him and said, do not trouble yourselves to the people for his life is in him. So this is pretty much how Paul's rolling here. God is working another miracle, a whole other miracle through Paul as a gift of mercy to this young man, Eutychus. And for Paul, it's only a slight distraction. I mean, something happens here. It's like, bing, my distraction goes. I'm so distracted. But for Paul, this guy falls out the window. He goes down. He just deals with the situation, has amazing faith. And it was only a slight dis a distraction. But what it does is that it proves and it confirms the teachings of Paul instead of becoming a distraction. And Paul is also showing great concern and passion for him. Well, why would Paul fall on him, though? It's kind of interesting. I've not seen that before in the book of Acts. Well, he probably, most likely, it's thought by the commentators, that he received this by knowing about Elijah, also Elisha as well his protege. 1 Kings 7.21, Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodged by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. It's a great example. Paul's like, well, Elijah's done it. I had the faith. I'm going to do it the same way. And so what he's doing is he's showing as well as Elisha, the descent or the falling down of God's power upon that situation, bringing life, in this case, back into this dead Eutychus. Paul then, in verse 11, it says, he just picks it up, and he says, now when he had come up and broken bread and eaten, talked a long while, even till daybreak he departed. So even the young guy Eutychus is still not there until verse 12. Verse 12, and they brought the young man in alive and they were not a little comforted. Meaning like, oh my goodness, this is so amazing. They were so comforted. But then Paul does continue with communion and this young man does live. In verse 13, now he's leaving. He's going from here, from Troas to Miletus and he's leaving on foot. And one of the neat things that we see in verse 13, it says through, through 16, then he went ahead, then we went ahead to the, to, ship, to the ship and sailed to Assos, there intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. We settled there from there, and the next day came opposite Chios, or Chios. The following day we arrived at Samos and stayed in Trogilium. The next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So he's hurrying to Jerusalem, and he's doing it on foot. And I'm thinking, you know, after all this stuff that's happening, he just wants to get alone with God. I don't know, do you guys have time to get alone with Jesus? 
Do you guys, in our busy days, in our contemporary lifestyles, we have time to get along with, alone with Jesus, just walking with God? Well, Enoch walked with God. Noah walked with God. I think it's pretty good company as they just walking with the Lord. Verse 14, we see that Paul um, boards that ship and he heads out. In verse 16, it says that Paul decided to sail past Ephesus so he would not have to spend time in Asia. There's a lot of stuff that happened in Asia, a lot of things going on with the church plants and the people. But sometimes I think that God's servants, those of us who serve the Lord in whatever capacity, sometimes need to be alone and think. I know I do. We need to meditate it. We need to pray. Those kinds of things. Paul knows that he's facing danger back in Jerusalem. So he needs time to walk with Jesus and he needs time just to talk with Jesus. I think for so many of us, our days wig us out so much and freak us out so much that we just need time to walk and talk with Jesus. In closing, I've got a story for you. A missionary returning home after many years of service was asked, tell me what you found when you arrived in New Guinea. Found? I found something that looked more hopeless than if I had been sent to a jungle of tigers. What do you mean? Why, the people seemed utterly devoid of any moral sense. Here's an example he gave. Some. If a mother was crying her little baby and the baby began to cry, she would throw it into the ditch and let it die. If a man saw his father break a leg, he would leave him by the roadside to suffer by himself. They had no compassion whatsoever. They didn't even know what the word meant. Well, was asked, what did you do for them? I thought it best to show them my faith by my works. When I saw a baby crying, I picked it up and consoled it. When I saw a man with a broken leg, I sought to mend it. When I found people distressed and people hungry, I took them in, comforted them, and fed them. But finally, they inquired, what does this mean? Why are you doing all of this for us? Then I had my chance, and I preached the gospel. Did you succeed? My friend said the missionary, when I returned home on Forlo, I left a church. A lot of neat stuff happens when we just look upon others and we look to leave an impression upon other people's lives. I mean, really seek to do that. We have a choice. They can remember us for the, the really neat things and the blessings, or they can remember us for just being a bunch of bozos. That's how it comes down. We have a choice in that. I think our prayer this afternoon before communion as ushers come forward is that, Lord, we may stay for a while in people's lives that we might leave enduring footprints on their hearts. Maybe that's our prayer this morning. That we not be forgotten. As the ushers now hand out the elements to you all, we talked about Passover. Talk about a feast or days of unleavened bread. And now this is what we're talking about this, this, this morning. Is the sacrifice that Jesus made to each and every one of us by his death on the cross. It's not to be taken lightly and it's not to be taken without reverence. Yeah, it's just juice and a cracker. That's it but it's what it represents that's most important. I want you guys to think about what it would be like to handle the dead body of Jesus. What will it be like? What would you do to handle the dead body of Jesus Christ in your arms? Would his death not be more of an impact in your life? I think too many of us don't look at the death of Jesus Christ in that way. It needs to be personal with us. 
It needs to mean something to us. So I want you to imagine in your mind's eye holding the body of Jesus Christ. Man, I pray it means something to you this morning. Because He did die for you and for me. And it's that broken, bloody body that is our Passover lamb. And the juice represents His blood. And the bread, His fractured body, broken for you and me. That's what it means. So as you hold the elements in your hand, close your eyes. Because we're holding the body of Christ in a way. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, so much for giving us eternal life. And I thank you, God, for being our Passover lamb that your blood was shed for us, that we have been redeemed. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for what you did up on Calvary. In Jesus' name.